Thank you very much. I'm going to try to just project without the microphone. Can everybody hear me? Can anyone not hear me? All right. Good. Uh, and Howard, thank you. Uh, Ruth, thank you for uh, accosting me outside uh, of the NIH conference in, uh, in September last year, because that's when she said, uh, would you like to come? And here I am, and I'm very honored uh, to be here, particularly in the Andrew Wiles building. Uh, I just think that's very cool. Um, so just a little bit of background uh, on myself. Um, I am a card-carrying math geek. I, I was not an athlete. I loved sports when I was a kid, uh, but it was really the numbers that excited me, the statistics, the baseball statistics, and whatnot. Um, and then I was on the high school math team. That was my version of sports. Uh, that is what I was uh, able to do. But um, instead of going into mathematics, which I wanted to do, I wanted to um, be a math teacher, a high school math teacher. Um, but I did not know that you needed a master's in order to teach. They told me that five minutes before graduation. And uh, so I became a writer instead. And uh, when, you, when you are a sports writer who loves math, you are naturally drawn to baseball. Okay, and you have a lot of probability concepts there. And I'm just getting to you know my, explain my my connection uh, to baseball. And by the way, I think that what th what my talk, what I want this to be about, is we hear about evidence and we hear about the importance of evidence. But in my line of work, the issue is not what is evidence, but what you're told is evidence by experts, and it isn't evidence. But just because they call it evidence doesn't make it so. And it, this is sort of my forensic approach to looking at scientific studies and other claims. But so when you, when you get to baseball, there's very basic probability concepts in play. If you have Derek Jeter, and uh, he is a 333 hitter, okay, which means he gets one hit in every three at-bats. Hopefully folks here know a little bit about baseball. Does anyone not know anything about baseball? Because if so, okay. <laughs> All right, so I'm glad I asked, uh, but let me, just ex let, let me just explain, okay, that it, it, when it comes to the announcers over baseball games, you're basically talking about uh, Burton Ernie teaching probability, so we'll just do that. I wrote a book uh, on the history of baseball statistics that, yes, is still available on Amazon and other bookstores nationwide. Uh, I wrote a lot about math in baseball, but... Um, it was really when the issue of concussions and mild traumatic brain injury kind of fell into my lap that my, my approach became more of a public health issue. Okay, I was in the entertainment business for a long time. But then all of a sudden I was dealing with a subject that was life and death uh, to some children and also we were learning a little bit about the effects of chronic brain trauma we knew it in boxers, and then all of a sudden, okay, a player in the National Football League, a deceased player, was discovered to have the same brain disease as boxers. And this was really quite remarkable. Now, it was also an N of one. Now, he was the first man, first football player ever examined. This is important. And the first time a player was examined, he had this incredibly rare disease that is caused only by brain trauma, by chronic brain trauma, but it's an N of one. Well, then another player, the next player examined, also had it. So it's two out of two now. Then a third. The third player examined also had this very rare condition caused only by brain trauma. This is when I showed up, and it was three out of three. And then it was four out of four. And I said, something's up. Now, the National Football League told me that everything's hunky-dory and told the rest of the press. Here is their example. There are, there are a great many people who have played football who have no problems at all. Well, that's not the point, OK? The point is how many healthy individuals are there in this group, how many, player, how many players have the disease, and how that compares to the national population. 
by the way, notice the incredibly subtle metaphor of apples and oranges. Okay, and now here's another explanation, and these are actually probabilistic explanations. Okay, this is math, according to them. Now they're saying that the, the dementia that players are experiencing, they say, hey, lots of people in society have dementia. Well, the thing is, is again, that's not the point, okay? And so the issue, now the disease is called chronic traumatic encephalopathy. That's the official word. And so in, in the general population, there are probably about 80 people in this room. If we examined everybody, you can only do it after death. Nobody here would have it, okay? Nobody. But let's just say it's one out of 80. Okay, but we know that the chances of having it are greater than zero, okay? So the question is, what is the probability that a football player will get dementia? And what the NFL was arguing was that, hey, it's only four players. You can't make scientific statements on just four, on an N of four, but you can if it's the first four players examined for a one out of 80 shot, what's going on? It's not one out of 80, fellas. Something is going on. There is some reason why these players are having this terrible trouble. So there's a big difference between four and four out of four. And this is where my math background came in handy. Now, the commissioner of the National Football League, Roger Goodell, had his own theory. And when I was speaking with him at a conference, this is what he told me. Here. Here, you might have missed that. I think you missed that. So that's how they were trying to cover it up. They were saying, well, it might have happened swimming. Like, no, it didn't, Roger. Okay, and we're going to skip this guy. Okay, and so what I was trying to do was not only explain that the probabilities involved here, that something was going on to have these guys be different. There was something about them that was different. It wasn't just four, okay? And my approach to it is that these numbers, which everyone, you know, is tossing around, these are actual people, okay? And so, you know what? I'm actually going to skip a little bit because I have a feeling that we're going to run, I'm going to run long. But anyway, the point is, is that I sort of figured out noodling on scratch paper at the Marriott in Puerto Rico, ignoring my wife um, and child. Um, <laughs> And I sort of figured out the prevalence rates of football players and of dementia. And in fact, the rates were far higher, far higher, okay? And then an official study was done and they found almost the exact same thing, that football players had dementia later in life five times that of the national population. And this stuff wouldn't have come out if the New York Times hadn't kept hammering and hammering and hammering, saying that, no, it's not that a lot of guys, that, you know, people in society get dementia. It's, th there's something about the numbers going on that told us, that warned us that something was going on. These guys had a health risk that was more than the National Football League said they did. And, what, and that discovery that the NFL was covering up this problem is what made it a national and even global issue where people realized, oh my goodness, this is actually more of a problem than we thought it is. Um, 
So anyway, it became a very big deal. And uh, so now I want to explain another time where the National Football League uh, decided to play some numbers games, OK? We had a study. A sick, they, they said, we're going to look at, football, at our football players for six years, OK? And count, there are 30 teams, and count how many concussions there were in six years. And they said there were 887 concussions. OK, and that's every single one that took place during that time, OK? So the average, each team was about 29.6. OK, well, I'm reading the study more carefully. And buried on one of the pages is the range among teams. The average was 30, but one team, some teams had as low as 6, and some teams had as many as 72. Random variables don't act like that. OK, normal curves don't stretch that far in 887 trials. And so I said, that's not possible. And when you noodle, and that's, that's my noodling again, <laughs> um, and these, you know, I wanted to show you kind of how this stuff happens in the press, OK? But then when you look at the distribution, OK, and the average, they say the average is 29. Well, that's not possible if the high is going to be 72. And it has to be 72 because there's no such thing as a false positive with concussions, OK? So we have to move the curve so that the high is roughly 72. And of course, there, this is not perfect, but it's more conceptual, all right? You end up with an average of about 47. And so instead of roughly 30, you now have an average of 47. That's 17 concussions per team that they missed, that they did not include. And that's about 500 missing concussions. So that means they dropped out about 30% of the concussions in the study. And when you actually look at the database, you can figure out, it's all coded, but if you figure out the codes, you figure out that they covered it all up. They didn't include most of the really bad concussions that took place. And so all of their research was completely, I think, flawed is a very charitable term for it. Uh, the word tobacco should pretty much capture everything about it. So I went on to look at mental health, OK? Now, you get these press releases, OK? And most people write about the press releases. And painkiller epidemic grips 80% of workplaces. OK, yes, opioids are a very bad you know, situation. There's a very bad situation in the United States. It's no joke, OK? But the thing is, so I'm like, all right, you know, and I'm asked to write about this. Well, and you get to the news release, and in fact, it does say 80% of workplaces. Well, guess what? You look at the actual study, and you find out that these workplaces, if you see, the workplaces are huge. The average number of people in these workplaces is 500. And all they asked was, have you observed an issue in the entire workplace? 80% have observed an issue in, in at least one of their 500 employees. Well, golly, guys, what a shock. OK? In fact, one of the issues is family member affected. And I got in a fight with my editor. I'm like, I can't write about this. This is absurd. Ugh. Anyway, I went on to ADHD, OK? Which, which has a very high diagnosis rate in the United States. Other countries much lower, although it's growing. I have written a book on this, uh, which will be available in September, so uh, worldwide. So, but the thing is, is that they also use probabilistic arguments to try to explain how prevalent it is. Here is one that's been used for decades, okay? About 5% of school-aged children have ADHD, so that's one in every classroom, at least one in every classroom. 
okay, that sounds reasonable if the classroom is about 25 kids and 5%, and so yeah, there's at least one in every classroom. But the thing is, is if they're randomly distributed, there might be more than one in some classrooms and none in others, and it's a very basic probability question where if the prevalence is 5% and the classroom size is 25, okay, the probability of a diagnosis is one out of 20, there are 25 trials, but the probability that there's one or more in a classroom is only 72%, because a lot of them are gonna have none. And so 28% of classrooms do not have a kid with ADHD. Now, that's not just a mathematical mistake, that means that if they make sure that every kid in a classroom has the diagnosis, that raises diagnosis rates 43%, like that. And these are the things that I love figuring out. Now, they have another saying, which is that ADHD is both overdiagnosed and underdiagnosed in the United States. Now, we understand what they mean, okay? What, they're mean, what they mean is that some kids are getting the diagnosis when they shouldn't, overdiagnosed, and some kids are getting the diagnosis are not getting the diagnosis when they, sh when they really are struggling, and that's bad too. Okay, but now let's look at what that means in real life, okay? In the, let's just say that the prevalence of, ADH of true ADHD in the United States is five to 8%. A lot of people here will think that's too high, but trust me, 8% is what we're gonna be dealing with here. Now, the CDC has determined that 11% of currently living children have received the diagnosis, okay? So immediately, it's too high, right? Okay, so you have 11% have received the diagnosis. That means 8% are correct at most, and 3% are incorrect. But it gets worse. That, those are the overdiagnosed. But, but the thing is, they say that there are lots of kids out there who have the disease, the, the disorder, but haven't been diagnosed yet. Okay, fine, so let's call that 2%. That's basically what they are talking about. But if 2% have it and are underdiagnosed, that comes out of the 8% who have the disorder. So that means that only 6% of the 11% are correctly diagnosed. And 5% of the, 5 out of the 11% are misdiagnosed, which, as we know, is a, we obviously figure out, is a 45% misdiagnosis rate. Roughly half of the kids in the United States who have been diagnosed with ADHD basically do not have the disorder. They may have other problems, they may benefit from medication, I'm not saying we ignore their issues, but name me another condition in medicine that accepts a, mis a misdiagnosis rate of roughly half. No one else tolerates that, and here we treat ADHD with some of the most powerful psychotropic medications known to man, which are stimulants. Now again, they're not the devil's work, but they're serious stuff, and I don't think I th my feeling is that if you're going to tell a child there's something wrong with your brain, you better damn well be right. And we're only right about half the time. And I think that's an awful shame. It changes the child's personal narrative. So now this is something I'm dealing with literally right now, and I can't tell you what the safety product is, okay? But here we have safety product A that a, a theoretically an outside entity is figuring out how um, effective is this product at decreasing, at reducing injuries, okay? Then that's fine, they're allowed to try to figure that out. And so let's just say that the usual number of injuries is 100. I'm simplifying this, as I am everything, obviously, but nonetheless it's instructive. So okay, normally in this activity you have 100 injuries among the population. And then when you use safety product A, there were only 80, that's a fact. They were only 80 when they used safety product A. 20% reduction, great. Well, when you look closely at the data, 
they also used another safety product in some, uh, in roughly half, of the subjects. And when you use safety products A and B, it reduced to 50. And with A alone, which is the thing they were talking about, it was 110. <laughs> and nonetheless, the press release said people who used A had 20% fewer injuries. And that's like a confounding variable if I've ever heard one. I mean, that's basically you're studying thirst levels, okay? And before dinner, it, the thirst level was 100. People who ate pork chops had a lot, had higher thirst, but people who had water in pork chops had lower thirst, okay? And so people who ate pork chops had 30% less thirst. <laughs> Come on! <laughs> and no one checks these things. So listen, to wrap it up, I do, want to, I do want to show that probability does not rule everything. Okay, there's lots of areas where we can throw all of the, what we believe and what we live by out the window, okay? It should be 50-50 that you put the plug in correctly. It is not. <laughs> Clinical trials have shown that 80% of the time you will choose the wrong, the wrong way. Similarly, if you just blindly try to get the shampoo in the hotel, you will about 75% of the time grab the body lotion. Okay, similarly with bread, the twisty is never the way you think it's going to be. <laughs> and when you turn on a light bulb and you have the switch, okay, 92% of the time it will go on in your face. And so it's not 50-50 and we can't just bow at the altar of probability. Oh, the USB port. <laughs> Tell me I'm wrong. It's not 50-50. Okay, and now we go back to baseball, and I think we can learn a lot from athletes. When you don't do so well for so long, you have to eventually get better. It's the law of physics. And so, thank you very much.